I'm Chuck Reeves. As you see, yes, I am a founding member of WorstCon. Uh, if you're not sure about that, come see me afterwards. I'll tell you all about it. Fun stuff. And this is Stop Multiplying by 4, software estimation. I will say this. You will get your estimates wrong. Yes, you will. Why? What this guy says. Because the future is not written yet. Nobody's is. We don't know what it is. But what I'm going to teach you here is a way to eliminate how wrong you really are. And then what you can do to sort of correct that. So we start is, my first question I always get asked is, why even bother estimating? We hear stories from Google and Spotify. They don't have deadlines for their projects or their features. They just sort of go ahead and do it. Well, that's because an estimation is not about trying to meet a deadline. It leads to the next question that, what is an estimate? An estimate is about effort, how much effort is involved into doing something. So that this way, the product owners know how much money they need to invest in or whether the gain from this feature that you want to develop will be beneficial to the company. And finally, why should a developer estimate? Why do we care? Why not just give it off to the project managers or the product owners? Well, it's because we own the code. We're the ones that are going to be doing the code. You don't go to some random person at a hospital and ask them, hey, how long is this surgery going to take, like the janitor? No, you want to go to the person who's actually doing the surgery so you can get the idea on how everything is going to come into play and whether or not it's safe and everything. So that leads that. Now, we hear a bunch of dumb ways to estimate. And I'm going to play a clip from the Development Hell podcast, if you guys are familiar with it. And this is from Chris Harchis, grumpy programmer on Twitter. And this is just the dumb thing that he does to estimate. And we'll go break it apart. OK, I'll tell you how I estimate things. So I sit down and I figure out how long I think it would take me to do it. Then I double that time. And then I push it up to the next, the next point on the time progression scale, where the time progression scale starts off seconds, minutes, hours, days. So if I think something's going to take me four hours to do, I will double it to eight, and I say it will take me eight days to get it all completely done, yep. start to finish. And I'm usually right, because there are so many impediments. If you're doing it, if you're the only one doing it yourself, your schedule can be very accurately accurate. Once you have to involve other people, you might as well just make numbers up. You might as well say, I think it's going to take me blue days to get done. Funny, a funny story about this clip, the first time I spoke ever was at PHP Tech 2014. It was this talk. I played this clip saying how dumb it is to do it, and sitting right there two rows back, who I've never met before, was Ed Finkler and Chris Harches right there. And I'm just like, oh, God. So, but now, people who know Chris and Ed, you know they're smart people. It's not that we developers are dumb and we can't figure this out. The problem comes into play that we try to solve estimation the same way we solve code. And that is through a process that I like to say is a deduction. Now, who here can tell me the exact number value of x? Anyone? Just yell it out. Thank you. OK, good. <laughs> it's not blue. All right. This is a process called deduction. Deduction is a, is a way that we can solve things algebra algebraically or formatically. We just know that we have to take x, subtract 2, and then we get 3. But this is sort of a naive way. We want the exact number value of x when it comes to estimation. So how would we figure this out? We got to find what y is. All we know right now is that x is 2 less than whatever y is. But that's not good enough for an estimate. This is a naive approach to something called induction. I'm not going to talk fully about induction because philosophers have been talking about it for years. But this is a naive way of doing it. Basically, what we're saying is, based on our previous experience with a problem or something scientifically, we're going to infer what's going to happen in the future. So here, we're trying to be practical. So what do we do it? Requirements are the key. That's what we do. How many people actually gather requirements before starting a feature? Yeah, I don't see, I see a couple of hands coming up here. Yeah, most of the time it's just like build me something and be done with it. So let's take a look at a requirement. I've seen something like this in the past as a contractor. Let's imagine that we have this great requirement right here. Is this a good requirement? It's not a good requirement, yes. Thank you. It's got a lot of fluff inside of it. The problem I find is when I'm talking to a product owner, they're trying to sell me on the feature. I don't need to be sold on the feature. I'm going to build this feature for you. So I don't care how awesome the service is. That's not going to help me build this out. So this is what I like to call a wordy expression. It's just fluff that's inside of a requirement that is not needed. It adds no value to what's going on. So let's go and clean this up a little bit and say, all right, we're going to have a contact form. There's going to be fields for name, email, and a valid phone number. 
There's a couple of things with this. I like to have two parts to a requirement. I like to know who the actors are and what's gonna happen with those actors. So in this case, we're gonna have two actors. One is our sales team, one is the leads. And then how are they gonna interact with each other? So this is key to, require, uh, key to any requirement is to define who these actors are so that we know what they're going to be doing. So with that, we clean it up a little bit more. And you see, now we're starting to get stuff here. Does this seem a lot better? Do we like this requirement? Anyone? Shout out, it's totally fine. Yes. yes? I still don't like this. This is still a little bit off to me, right? Take a look at valid. It says valid phone number. Does that, does that mean that name and email aren't supposed to be validated? Does that mean that they're not required? No, right? Uh, this is a concept in English called a misplaced modifier. You just put something in like the wrong spot that sort of changes the meaning around. Keep in mind, you're talking to non-technical people. You're talking to people who may not even speak English well too, depending on what's going on where you're working. So you really wanna make sure this is all cleaned up. I have a famous uh, tweet right here, I love this one. Prevent children from ingesting dangerous medicines by locking them in a childproof cupboard. Three children per cupboard is a good fit. This is a perfect example of a misplaced modifier right here. So you get the point right here that it changes the meaning of what you're trying to convey and communicate. So now let's say we have this done here. This looks a lot better, right? Contact form, we have everything sort of placed out in the right way. I still have a problem with valid phone number though, right? From this list, can anyone tell me which one of these phone numbers is invalid? Good, yeah, the answer is none of these are invalid. These are all valid phone numbers that you can call. So do we want our leads people to put in 911? Right, what's that? I thought I heard somebody say something. We're trying to sell them our product. We're really gonna call up 911 and go, hey, this is John from sales for our awesome product right here. We wanna tell you about it. And be like, what's your emergency? But these are all valid phone numbers. So when dealing with requirements, I like to say to remove these sort of requirement smells. Just like we have code smells, these are sort of requirement smells that I see. They just need to be cleared up right here. My favorite is simple, easy, quick, and user-friendly. Can anybody tell me what user-friendly is? What simple is on a technical scale? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still waiting for somebody. I have a huge Archie elephant from PHP Tech that I will give to somebody if they can tell me what user-friendly is. But anyways, we want to remove our code smells. Now, also, one thing that we tend to always remove from our requirements is all of the technical functions, right? We're gonna use UTF-8. We wanna define the lengths of everything. As I said before with the phone number, we're gonna actually find out that, oh, well we wanna actually contact this third party service and find out if the phone number is valid that way. So now, based on what we originally got from this, from this requirement saying that we needed to validate the phone number, we now have to talk to a third party. Does that change around what you originally thought the amount of effort was for that original requirement, right? We have this service we gotta to talk to, we gotta have error handling, what happens if the service goes down, what are we gonna do then, all this fun stuff. All right, so we have our requirements, we found out what we're doing right now, let's start estimating on it. What do we do? Well, what we have to do, oops, sorry, trackpad's a little too sensitive right there. We have to break it down into our smaller components. The big thing about estimation is that you wanna eliminate uncertainty. Right? When we have one big megalithic feature, everything about it is uncertain. But if we break it down into smaller chunks, we know, okay, we know how to do a uh, email lookup service. We could do a regular expression, which is terrible, but you kind of get the point right there. We already know how to do it. The phone validation service, that's interesting. We've never worked with it before, but I'm sure everyone here knows how to build a simple form. And we all know how to build a little AI to walk around and, sorry, excuse me, a UI and walk around in management for the leads right there. So now we're breaking it up. All right, so lead management, we know is gonna take about X amount of effort and email we've already done before. But this phone service is gonna take a while. So how can we figure out this phone service? I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna stick on the phone service for the rest of this talk. So the first thing in every estimator is gonna talk about this is historical data. That's key to any estimation. How many people here drive to work? Good, I see one person over there in a red shirt right there. If you were to have to go to a meeting tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., what time would you have to leave to get to work? 7.30. How did you come up with 7.30? Exactly, right? Every, he just made an estimate right there. That's a pretty good estimate, right? We know in the past that it took him 30 minutes to get to work, so it's gonna take him 30 minutes tomorrow to get to work. The problems that we run into as always, is normally scope creep, 
or feature creep. So if there's a major accident tomorrow and your normal route is backed up, you either have to change your route or estimate more time for it. The next thing I like to do is a dry run for it. This ties in greatly with unit testing as well. Basically what you're doing is we're just going to code it and then we're not going to spend too much time on it, but we're going to see what we get back from this REST service. I can write a simple unit test to see, oh, if I put in my phone number, it should tell me that it's valid. If I put in everyone here at work's phone number, they should all tell me that those are valid. And that gives you an idea on how the service works and some of the pitfalls that you can find with it. Now, an important tool for estimation is the confidence interval. Every estimator is going to talk about the confidence interval, and probably all of you know, here know what this is, but if I ask, does anyone know what this is, no one's going to raise their hand. Does anyone know what it is? Has any, oh, I got one person. All right, has, another person right there. Has anyone ever seen a weather report ever? You know what the confidence interval is. When you're getting a forecast, they're telling you a high and a low. They're saying the temperature is going to be between 60 and 50, whatever that is. The confidence interval is a statistical tool, we'll put it that way, that says the true value of what we're trying to estimate is going to be between a range of numbers. So what a weatherman or what the person is telling you is, we are sure to a certain level of degree that the temperature is going to be between X and Y. This is very important when you're estimating. You don't want to give hard numbers because you're going to be held to those hard numbers. You always want to give a range. So this way you can see sort of the flexibility that comes involved with everything. A famous estimator, John Maynard Keyes, say it is better to be, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it is better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. That is very important with the interval right there. If I tell someone it's going to take exactly 20 hours to do, I'm getting a phone call at 21, 59, whatever, saying, where's this thing? And I go, oh, I need an extra few hours for it. It's important that they know this for many reasons that are probably outside the scope of this, but always use a uh, range when estimating. So now I have two questions here. Now, don't shout out the answers just yet. First question, and also, everyone has laptops, so don't Google the answer. You're trying to better yourself as estimators. So try your best to try to figure out what is the wingspan of a 747? and whether or not the second statement is true or false. I, I asked not to shout out the answer. Keep it to yourself. Because what I want to do is I want to try to improve some of this for you people, for everyone here. So we have uh, a couple of different ways that we can narrow down what that range is for the wingspan and whether or not our value is true or false. The first one is repetition. This is always a good one. Oftentimes, I'm always asked, hey, how long is something going to take? I tell people, Give me a couple hours, think about it. Because what I'll do is I'll do my initial assessment, I'll go to lunch, I'll come back. After a full stomach, I go, oh, I didn't think about this case scenario. Let me re-estimate again, and I may go up and down. Or I may find something online that will help me better my estimate and better my range. Another thing that's good, and pros and cons helps out a lot, because what you're doing is you're eliminating sort of biases that we have inside of ourselves. The question goes, OK. We have to build this REST service to talk to this phone number service that tells us to do whatever it is. What happens if it doesn't work? What happens to the company as a whole if it doesn't get it right? And you go, hmm, ah, that doesn't feel good. So then you're sort of relying a little bit on your gut instinct to improve on your estimation and try to make it worth your while. The absurdity test is my, is my favorite, my absolute favorite. This works great. Any, any size company, this works fantastic. Basically what you do is you start with an insanely large range of values and you just narrow it, narrow it, and narrow it down. So for instance, let's go back to the 747. How many people think that the wingspan of a 747 is between uh, one foot and one mile? Okay, yes. How about, uh, let's do something even more absurd, three feet and five feet. Yeah, probably not. That's probably wrong right there. So let's narrow it down. How about 100 feet to 500 feet? More people are raising their hands. What about 150 to 300? You see what we're doing? More and more people are sort of raising their hands inside of it. That's a prime example of the absurdity test right there. It's fun because you can make a good game out of it too, especially when you're working with people. I'm going to get to it. Don't worry. The answer's coming. This is coming. We still have one last thing over here, one last bullet point, the equivalency bet. This one is also kind of a fun one. This involves a bit of gambling as well. So it's good in a group. You have fun with it. Basically, the idea is there's a wheel that you're going to spin. You have a 90% chance to win 
on the wheel and a 10% chance to lose. The way this works is you take your estimate and you bet it against winning against the wheel, right? So remember, you have a 90% chance to win. Let's say $100 right here. How many people will take their estimate over betting against the wheel? Everyone here is going to take the wheel? Oh, good. Nobody raised their hands. That's actually how you want to be. You want to be so unsure against the wheel versus your estimate. Here's the thing. If you go with just your estimate against the wheel, that means you're a little overconfident in your estimate because you think, oh, this thing's going to pay out 90% of the time. I'm more than 90% sure that my estimate is correct. Eh, could be, could be wrong. Or if you want to go against the wheel versus your estimate, you're probably underestimating the time. That means you're not too sure about your estimate right there. You want to have a neutral feeling when it comes to what's going on uh, with your estimate right here. So the correct answers, here you go, 211 feet. Anyone with their original thoughts get the number right? Get the range right, I should say? One person. What was your, what was your estimate? My, my range, I made a range of yeah. 175 There you go. That's a really good one right there. That's really close, right? You want it close as possible right there. Right? A lot of people don't get this right the first time. Don't worry, it takes practice. Also, uh, anyone get it? I heard one person shout true, so everyone else probably got it right that it's true. Yes. Okay. The reason why we have a true or false right there is because 80%, believe it or not, even though you have a 50 50 chance of getting it right, 80% of the time, you're going to doubt whether or not it's true or false. So keep that in mind. Another fun tool for estimating is Fuzzy Logic t shirt. Can everyone see that? I just realized the colors may be too dark. Can everyone see that back there okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So the idea is, is that, and I also heard, um, uh, who was it? I heard somebody on a podcast say, you know, I use the fish scale, and they had like carp and herring and sardine and everything. It's the same sort of approach to it. You have different size categories on an effort. These numbers are actually taken from a book, Software Estimation 2. I will definitely provide you links in the ISBNs as well. But this is sort of an uh, industry study from a bunch of big companies, IBM, Cisco, Oracle, on their estimates and how much each line of code is, right? So once we have the lines of code for something, what do we do with that? Well, I'm sure a lot of us here use some version of, some form of version control, right? Is anyone here not using version control? Just walk out, <laughs> okay, right? But guess what? You can look back in your commit histories and find out how many lines of code you wrote, and then you can apply a velocity to it. We've heard velocity before. I know it's an agile term. We don't like, some people don't like agile right there. But you get an idea on how much effort it takes to write a certain feature. So if you're saying, okay, this feature for me is very large, you're looking at about 2,000 lines of code, right? Simple enough, makes sense. This one can also be a little fun too. As I said, someone did it with fish. Another uh, useful tool, this works well with groups of developers, you can't really do this by yourself, is the Wideband, Delphi, or Group. Now normally I bring volunteers up on stage, but I only have 40 minutes, so probably won't be able to do this. But the idea is you have somebody who asks everyone in the group to write how long it's going to take on an index card or a piece of paper, whatever, how long it's going to take something to be done. The product owner then goes and tallies all this up and figures out what the average was and the highs and lows and displays it. So we see in round one, we see someone said it'll take two hours, another person said it would take nine hours, and it averaged out to about six and a half hours from everybody in the group. Well, then what we do is we all get together and we say, the product owner comes in and goes, all right, everyone agreed it was going to take about six and a half hours, right? Now, the person who said two hours goes, no, 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 it's going to take two hours. But the person who had nine hours is going to say, wait, but you didn't think about this other feature or this other thing or this other scenario that's coming into play. And then everybody can hash it out. Once you're done hashing it out, do it again. And we see that, oh, well, the guy who said two hours moved up to about five. And the guy who said nine moved down to eight based on something that they discovered. Right? And they have another discussion about it. And then eventually you do it a third time. You can keep going and going as many times as you want. Try not to do it more than like four or five times, I recommend. But you should, can certainly keep going until you get the close range of about six right there. Now, again, this is precise. This is a precise number. You can definitely do this with the ranges as well, too. It's just a little hard to represent it on a graph. All right. No estimation talk ever is going to be complete without talking about Bayes' theorem. Does anyone know what Bayes' theorem is? You may have heard it before. No. Uh, what we're looking at here is sort of naive Bayes. Uh, Bayes was a mathematician and philosopher back in the 1700s. And Bayes' theorem has been used for every, everything in AI for the past 20 to 30 years. 
The, what we see here is we're looking at probabilities. And the way this formula works is we're saying the probability of A or B happening is equal to the probability of B or, over A happening multiplied by the probability of A divided by B. I don't like talking about this too much because there's a lot of math. But if anyone can see this, there's sort of an inverse relationship going on with all the different probabilities. Basically, what we're talking about here is we're saying whenever you get new information, you have to re-estimate, right? You have to change your decision. That's a naive approach to Bayes right there. And of course, a lot of people who actually study Bayes is going to tell me, oh, that's not truly what it is. But again, it's only 40 minutes here. Most estimation talks go for all days, uh, for longer days, I should say. So it's important that when you find out some new bit of information, like when we go back to the phone service, let's say. We found out, oh, you know, they're rate limiting us only to 1,000 calls a day, so we're going to have to do some crazy caching scheme now so that we're not making so many calls. You have to present that back to the product owners immediately and say, oh, our original estimate is wrong. We have to rethink about this so that they can make the decision on whether or not it's okay to continue going. I'm going to go back to that in a little bit as well, so don't worry. But now we have all our estimates done. And now we have to prioritize our work. This is also important when it comes to estimation. I ask this question every time. How many people do like high, medium, and low for priorities? Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me guess. 80% of your features are high, about 18% are low, and may have like one or two that are medium. Does that sound correct to everybody here? Yeah. Everyone's going to have their own sort of bias into a feature, so everything comes high. So when you just do high, medium, low, everything becomes high. There are tons of studies behind it. But I present a couple of ways that you can sort of limit this out. One is the urgency matrix. This one's a lot of fun. So basically what you're doing is you take all your features and all your development, and you're putting them somewhere on this little matrix that we have going up here, based on whether or not it's urgent or critical. Because then what you're doing is you're taking everything you're saying, okay, Feature A is very urgent, but it's not so critical, so we're moving it down. Feature B is critical, and we need it done by, ne by next week, so we have to start that one right there. Then what you get here is a breakdown of what your high, mediums, and lows are. So for instance, if it's urgent and important, it becomes high. If it's urgent but not important, it becomes medium. And if it's neither, it's a low priority. You shouldn't have something that's urgent and not important, though. That just doesn't make a lot of sense. The next one is the best way to min-max priorities. Uh, it's using an Excel spreadsheet with a complicated formula. I have a link for the sheet that you can download for free in my slides. I will post my slides up on Twitter afterwards so you can come see this. You can also get a reference to it in Carl Weger's book at the bottom. But the idea is, is that you're having both parties on a scale of 1 to 10 rate either their cost and their value. That's important. There's a formula inside this sheet that will then take it out and break it at the end of the priority, and you just sort it numerically. I don't know why my sort is off. I just realized that. Lead UI should be higher, because it's the higher number right there. Anyways, as we can see here, we're getting a higher benefit from the actual salespeople, but a lower benefit from the development team for some of our features inside. So then we're going to lower the priority a bit right here. This one kind of doesn't really go well politically because product owners, after all, they're paying the money, so they want their stuff done first. But this is a good way to sort of curve all that out there, which leads me into sort of the politics of estimating, because we all experience this. The first thing to do is remove people from the problem. That sheet I just gave you was a great way to do it, because then you're actually giving them a number value that they understand. And they go, oh, OK, I see what's going on. I don't really need this feature right now. So I'm going to be a little less pushy, I guess is the best word to describe it. The next one is focus on the interests and not positions. So let's go back to our lead generator right there. Why is it so, we can ask some questions. Why is it so important that the phone number be valid? Can anyone take a guess on why someone might think we want to actually have a service validate a phone number? What was that? Trolls. Trolls is a good way to do it. And was that? Entrance, that's a big one right there. Typos. Typos, that's another one, right? You may come to find out that, oh, well, the reason why we want this is because our sales team is calling phone numbers that really aren't valid, so they're just getting a dead line. Well, that's great, but how often does that happen? Oh, it only happens 2% of the time. All right, well, we gave this long estimate right here, and based on our budget, we're looking at $100,000 to develop the service. I'm just making up numbers. 
So does that really justify all this effort for 2% of the calls? Right? When you give that little pushback right there, you'll get, oh, you're right. You know what? It's only 2% of the time, and it's going to take so much effort for us to support, so much infrastructure to support, because we have to do this whole caching service that we just found out. Maybe it's best that we just admit that. We don't need to do this feature right here, or we'll just lower the priority, and eventually we can get to it, which often is never the case, but you'll be surprised. Sometimes it does happen. Finally, this is important. Don't ever negotiate your estimate. This is the most important thing ever, all right? How many times have people gone to you and asked you to estimate something, and you give them an estimate, and they come back and go, oh, I didn't like that. And you go, oh, okay, well, I could actually do it a lot faster. <laughs> Let me give you a scenario, right? You need major heart surgery. You go to a cardiologist. Cardiologist says, it's going to take eight hours to perform the surgery. Do you go to the cardiologist and go, no, nah, I don't like that. He goes, okay, I can do it for you in five. <laughs> really? Right? We own the code. We're the ones doing the work, right? We are going to say, this is what it's going to take, right? Uh, people here have seen Star Trek, may, maybe some of you have, some of you have not. But if you watch original series Star Trek and then Star Trek Voyager, there was something very important going on inside of those two different shows. Scotty was the miracle worker. He always overpetted his estimates to Kirk and said, oh, I need three days to do it, and he would get it done in a day, and Kirk would be like, oh my god, you're a miracle worker. What's going on right here? But in Voyager, there was an early episode with Bellana Torres, who said, oh, it's going to take me three hours to fix this. And Jamie was like, I can't do that. I need you to cut it down. Bellana Torres goes, no, it's going to take me three hours to fix it. I don't care if you like it or not. When I say it's going to take this amount of time, it's going to take about this amount of time. That's what you need to do. You are going to be responsible for this. So you are going to be responsible when it fails, when you don't meet that deadline, when you go over budget. It is your responsibility, not the product owners, not the product managers. They will blame you because you're the one that told them, oh, originally they said 10 and it came down to 8, and now it's at 10 hours and we're now we're over budget. Right? That's going to be on you. Some final thoughts when it comes to estimation, and I'm going to open up for questions because a lot of people normally do have a lot of questions. I prefer hours as opposed to days. Hours tend to scale up a little easier than days. You can always put in a little extra time if you need to crunch down. I know I said you, know, you don't want to over or underestimate, but if you, if you find out that there's a trade show coming up on uh, the next Friday and you need to have everything done before then, you can kind of scale out hours a little bit more than days when it comes to your estimates. That's just my thing. But of course, you can use anything. Story points, if you're doing agile, you can certainly use days. I know someone who was using Tic Tacs, and Tic Tacs represented something. I'd, Tried to explain it to me, it didn't make any sense. Next thing, uh, throwing more developers at something never fixes any problems. It only causes more problems. For instance, it takes nine months to make a baby, right? Can nine women do it in one month? <laughs> Be interesting. Doesn't work like that. Does not work like that. Keep that in mind, all right? And as I've been saying, iterate and be honest. It is always important. Especially when it comes to scope creep. We always experience scope creep. It's always going to come up. So whenever that happens, you say, all right, if you want this new feature, take whatever we thought before was going to be the effort involved in this project, throw it out the window, and we're going to have to go through an estimation cycle again, which means you're going to have to review all the features. You're going to have to clean up all the features like I demonstrated in the beginning, and then we're going to have to go through and estimate it again. Now, Normally, estimation uh, speakers will spend days talking on different products that you can use, different procedures that you can use. There's so many different ways to estimate software. These are all backed by science, so it gets kind of intense on what's going on. But I only have 40 minutes. So I'm going to provide you guys with some additional references, and I'm going to open it up for some Q&A right here. First one I've already mentioned is uh, Carl Weegers, his book, Software Requirements. This gets into uh, sort of how you can form your requirements that will make sense to everybody on the team. And also, uh, as you saw, I had those requirement smells in there. That's where I got that list from. This is a very helpful book for that. Um, it's geared more towards product managers than developers. So, you know, approach it from that eye. But it's still a very good book to read when you need to know how to get your requirements. The next one is Software Estimation by Steve McConnell. This is another book that's really good. 
Uh, what he does in this book is break it down by team sizes and sort of the different patterns that you can use in larger and smaller teams. That's where I got the white band Delphi from and the t-shirt sizing. He recommends them there. Uh, he also gets into the politics, but again, he's talking from a perspective of a product manager than a developer, but it's still a good read to have as well. This book, everybody should read How to Measure Anything, Finding the Intangibles in, every, in Everything. Uh, Douglas Hubbard is a statistician. He goes around and uh, presents estimation talks. If anyone has a chance to see it, it's a great, great seminar to do. It's about a two-day seminar, uh, depending on how large the group is right there. But he breaks down everything that you need to do about estimation. It goes into, uh, he goes into finding the value of information. He goes into defining all your requirements out. He brings up a story saying how he went to the, uh, the Veterans Affairs Department and they said, we want to improve our IT security. How long do you think that's going to take to do? And he was like, what's IT security? <laughs> so what that, think about that. What is IT security? It means something to everybody else, right? What eventually he found out was that IT security actually meant, oh, we want to make sure our antivirus is up to date. We want to make sure that whenever there's a breach, we respond within 24 hours. All of these things that you didn't think went into IT security, you may think, oh, well, you know, we got to make sure that we have proper SSL set up and then we're using secure connections everywhere and password rotations. That was not what they wanted. They wanted a different thing that we thought of right there. He also goes into how you can actually model all of your data and estimates to make sure this goes, uh, it goes very well. So if any of those three books you can't buy, buy this one. This one's important to do. Uh, there's math in here too, but what's nice is it's all math done in Excel. So you don't need to have a differential calculus background to understand what he's talking about. All right, uh, so as I said, I normally have a lot of questions because estimation always takes a long time to talk about. So I always leave about 10 minutes, uh, and we have about 10 minutes left to open up to any questions from the audience to ask me anything. Yes. Yes. How many hours are in a day? So the question is, is, I prefer using hours over days. How many hours is in a day? And that's true. Everyone has a different uh, measure of hours within a day. That's why I find that they scale up a little better and scale down a little better. So yes, uh, hours always do tend to same because you get meetings, you get distractions. The best way to counteract that is to start monitoring with some time tracking software. A lot of people don't like that, but then you actually have data to back up saying, okay, we were here physically for 10 hours, but we only got three hours of work done. You're like, whoa, okay, that's a big problem. So your days are three hour work days. That's just how it works out. And then you can sort of eliminate why it's taking, why seven hours of your day is being eaten up. Right? It's being you know, meetings, is it distractions from other people, what's going on? So you can actually go back and say, this is really how long an hour a day is for us right there. So either we need to fix this or this is going to be our velocity. It's going to be three hours a day. If we say it's going to take 10 hours to do something, there you go. You can then do the math on it. Math is always a good ammo for your boss. Math is always the best thing that you can do. Right? I did something where I was actually tracking uh, Git commits and saying, okay, we develop uh, about 250 lines of code a day. And I would say, out of that, we added 50 lines of code, but we took away another 100 lines of code, because I looked at the diff right there. And the product owner was, wow, that's kind of insane. I go, yeah, that's because we're using, we have so many distractions going on at work that we realistically only get 300 lines of code a day done. So there's tons of tools out there that you can use to sort of track your velocity and try to identify the problems inside. I see someone over here. Yes, you, sir. Correct, yes, and uh, so he was mentioning how I'm diver differentiating between how actually long it takes to get done and how many physical days that represents. And it, it, anyone who practices Agile knows that that's velocity, right? That's exactly what velocity is. It is distance over time as opposed to just distance. So when we give an estimate, we're just giving the distance, but that's not the real velocity that's coming into play. So what's interesting about uh, both of these questions is if you find out that your velocity is very low and a product owner really wants something out the door very quickly for a deal, trade show, whatever it is right there, you just say, well, if you don't come to me with anything, I can speed up the velocity because then I'm just focused on this one task. So that's another pushback that you can do as well too. And hopefully make your working environment a little bit better. 
Any other questions? Yes, right there. So the question is, how do I properly estimate something I've never done before? Well, we all heard the saying, don't reinvent the wheel. But does that mean that we still build our wheels out of logs or stones? No, right? Hopefully. My, it would have been a very interesting ride down if I had to change my tire with a stone block. But the thing is, is that 80% of your problem is most likely already solved, believe it or not. right? So anytime I need to talk to, like for instance, in the phone validation service, I've talked to REST APIs before, there are libraries and tools out there to do it. So that's the one thing that I do first, is I always go, does something get me mostly there that will help solve my problem, but then I just need to spend a little less time working on it? So that's the one thing that I do first, is I always try to find something that's equivalent and then just suppose it onto what my problem actually is and solve it from there. The next thing I do is, as I mentioned before, I do a dry run. I'll just have a simple PHP script no frameworks, no nothing in it, and I'll just use the library and see what it gives me and see how I can play with it and manipulate the data around right there. I don't spend a lot of time doing that, but again, it gives me an estimate on sort of the pain points that I'm doing. A third thing you could do is always uh, take a look at, for instance, GitHub or Composer, see how popular things are, because if something's a little bit more popular, there's gonna be a lot more support for it. Find out if they have a channel and say, oh, this is my problem right here. Can I use this to solve this problem? Right? Or how would I use this to solve the problem? Even Stack Overflow, you can do the same thing as well. So you always want to try to sort of do these little testing to sort of it squeeze out what your estimate actually is. Any other questions? I saw, yes. How much is the percentage of uh, project management work, mostly development work, like the final meeting spent, you've done on the development center? What's the proper percentage? So, so the, the question, question is, what's, what's the, the ratio re between uh, development work and estimation work? It depends on the environment. When I was contracting, it was a big estimation up front and then mostly uh, just doing the work. And anytime something new would come up, I would spend time doing that. Now that I'm working full time, uh, we do practice Agile. So we have a product meeting beforehand, which is one day after our sprint. So out of a 30 month period, it's only about 1% of the time. It really depends on the work environment and the structure. You don't want to spend too much time estimating because then all you're doing is estimation. But you kind of want to phrase it where estimation does become a bit of an effort, so that it gives you more pushback. When scope creep happens, you can say, well, we need to go through another estimation cycle. And if your estimation cycles are taking a day, the manager will go, okay, I don't need this right now. Come back at the next estimation cycle, and we'll work it in there. So you really got to sort of tease out that sort of ratio. I can't give you an exact answer on it. So the question is, uh, how far do we break down our requirements, basically? Try to break them down into the smallest manageable component as possible, because then your estimate on that component is going to become more accurate. Also, when you, under, when you overestimate another feature right there, it does kind of buy you a little bit of time. But what you're saying is, is you're giving weight to all of these different features. So the smaller that you break it out, and say this has the most amount of weight right there, it sort of, it, it becomes an abnormality. And then we can focus on why is this one little feature, or one little feature that we thought was little, is taking so long to do. It's because it's much more complex in reality than the product owner is going to do. So try to break it down as small as possible. I normally don't break it down to like a function. I will try to sort of logically organize my functions together and say, OK, so the, I mean, I used a simple contact form service, and I broke it down to an email lookup and valid phone numbers and all of that. But I can always say, you know, it's just the contact form. This component right here has an estimate of 10 to 20 hours, let's say. Right? Yes, John McGann. Would you, would you something like that, take more time to break it down? Um, would that be something that you would charge the customer for, or is that just your, Uh, so the question is, when I'm breaking down my estimates, do I charge the customers? Uh, when I contract, no, uh, only because I'm trying to get the sale. Uh, when I do it full time, uh, obviously I'm getting paid for it, so yes. <laughs>
I, you know, I really can't answer it. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you, you can charge it if it's something really complex. Um, I did an open space once at a conference talking about uh, job interviewing and everything. And sometimes I notice when I'm contracting that they, they are trying to tease me out and work for free. So like I'll go, I, I had one job where I went in there and they sat me in front of a computer with WordPress and they go, we want you to write a WordPress module. I'm like, I'm going to charge you $600 for it. And they go, OK. And I just walked out. So you know, you don't want to. You don't want to spend too much time doing it, but as you're going through the estimation process, you also will find out, you know what, this, this client may not be a good fit for my needs as well. So I normally don't charge when I'm contracting for estimations. I think I saw someone, yes? Hot That is true. It also depends on whether or not um, enterprise or not enterprise. So the question was, do I have favorite software to use for estimation? Um, there's no right or wrong answer to that. Uh, Jira will allow you to put in estimations in the form of story points if you're using the Agile module. Uh, there was another one called uh, On Time Now that will actually let you put in hours, times, and even ranges as well. And you can do reporting on that. But uh, the price points between the two are very different. It's so like On Time Now is like $500 a user, or Jira is not that price pointy as well. Um, there are a couple of very, uh, Kokomo is another one that's out there, but you're talking like Oracle level prices for that. So again, it really comes down to what you're using. You can simply just use GitHub for a lot of this, because if you actually tell your developers, you know what, commit every hour, then you can actually, uh, you don't have to push every hour, but if you commit every hour, and then eventually when that gets pushed upstream, you can sort of give an idea of velocity right there, figure out lines of codes and counting from that. Um, Harvest is another one I use for time tracking when I'm billing and invoicing clients when I'm contracting. So that lets me you know, start and stop timers. But there are many ones out there, and not one is really better than the other. It's just what the features are versus the price point, in my opinion. And we'll go back to you. How do you take into account uh, like approval times when you estimate? Uh, so the question is, how do I take in approval times when I estimate? That's not part of my estimation at all. Uh, my estimation is purely development time. Because uh, I think what you're teasing at is sort of like, oh, well, you know, we need to go ahead and build this website, but because uh, a similar juxtaposition would be, but we need assets in order to actually go ahead and do this stuff. And you know what? The asset team is taking forever to do stuff, or the client is not giving us the deliverables on time. I always exclude all of that, um, only because it's not related to my work. I'm saying, when I get started, it's going to take me this long. And if I have everything in place, this is how long it's going to take me to do it. So I don't include any of that in my estimations. I think I saw up there, yes, sorry. So the question is, is there a strategy for knowing when you got enough requirements from the product owner? Yes and no. Um, a lot of the time, product owners are non-technical people, so they're not going to understand all the functional requirements that I'm giving them. But the best way to do this is to have a dialogue, find out what they're looking for in the product. Because then another thing you can do is present options to them that fit within the product that they're envisioning when it comes out to your estimates. So, you know, I'm not going to go and drill down and say, oh, you know, I need to know every single little feature inside of it. But I get a general idea of what the product is or what they're trying to sell. And then from that, I can sort of say, OK, well, then what's more important inside of this product right here? So for instance, I had one client where security was important and another client where security was sort of the afterthought right there. And I was able to estimate based off of that. And sure enough, it was a little less secure than they would have liked. But I did present that to them as well, too, as an option. So you sort of have to understand what the product really is and what it's trying to do in order to get your features. Any other questions? I'm almost out. I estimate I'm almost out. <laughs> oh, I got one minute left. Any other questions? Oh, I got two. Oh, boy. Anyone else over here? OK. I'll go with you, gentlemen, in the back with the blue shirt. So the question is, do I have any tips for when I'm blind bidding against other companies? Uh, I have a personal saying, uh, you know what, sometimes it's good to just let things fail. If a, uh, there was a famous study done uh, by two Dutch people who I'm not going to try to pronounce their names. I used to include them in the talk. 
And uh, sometimes what happens a lot when blind bidding happens is that these other companies are ingesting their own biases into the estimation, so their estimations tend to be very wrong or their estimations will then fit what the uh, client is actually looking for, the person who's actually seeking out work right there. But the big thing is you're not gonna know what they're gonna bid. It's important not to sell yourself short. If anything from this is not to sell yourself short. As I said before, don't negotiate your estimate. You're gonna own the product. And you know what, if you give them a bid and they don't like that, and you're trying to get their service, their business, then you know what, it's not a good fit for you because you're gonna be selling yourself short and you're gonna be over, overworking to produce something that's on a fixed bid, let's say, and now you've actually technically lost more money that way because of opportunity costs. And then, I'm sorry, I'll take this one last question. Anyone else has any questions, you can follow me on Twitter at Manchuk or seek me outside, ask me questions personally. I compile them all together and try to add them to this talk as well too, if it becomes pretty relevant. But I did see someone else over here. Yes, you, sir. So the question is, if I'm contracting and I give a range of, let's say, 15 to 25 hours and it takes me 20 hours, do I bill them for the remaining time? Depends on the deal. Uh, if it's a fixed bid, then it's a fixed bid and I have an extra 10 hours of work. So, yes, I will bill them for that. Uh, other times, if they're charging me hourly, then no, I won't because I'm done with the work. So, you know, um, there's a, a famous statistician called, uh, he worked for, um, uh, I want to say Hennessy, but he was a statistician who was trying to estimate out uh, hops productions throughout the year. And uh, there's, a, there's a saying called student's law. And the idea is if you pad your estimate, then what's going to happen is if you say it takes 20 hours to do something, you're going to procrastinate a little bit and then come on down and you're going to wait till the last minute to get something done. So you, that's also important to know that that's why you want your, act, your estimates to be as accurate as possible. So in that case, uh, again, I'm not really gonna overcharge them if I, over, if I underestimate just a little bit, you know? Um, because then I can just say, oh, and if they're happy with the product, it's great. So I can just go on. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. As I said, if you have any questions, hit me up on Twitter. I'll be outside as well, too. I hope you all enjoyed it. Do I have you? Okay, I do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>